Hello everyone, this is Jim Page for Fly Fishing for the Rest of Us. So this is the follow-on video that we have after we talked about your second fly rod, which is your 9 weight, 9 foot, with a good anodized saltwater reel on it, sealed bearing, 150 yards of backing, and a 9 weight, weight forward floating fly line. So this is going to talk about some flies that I take every, with me everywhere I go, and a little bit about leaders and some other items that you might want to take with you when you go saltwater fly fishing. So... When I think about saltwater flies and saltwater fly fishing, I think about the food that saltwater fish will eat. You've got other fin fish, you've got crustaceans like shrimp, you've got crabs, you've got lobster, small lobsters, you've got horseshoe crabs that redfish will eat, you've got uh, aquatic worms. On some flats have aquatic worms. You have sea cucumbers. Um, so even though there's a lot of diversity, the basic food groups are somewhat limited. Fish, shrimp, crabs, aquatic worms are hard to imitate. Um, horseshoe crabs, some people can imitate them. Um, clams, black drum, we eat little clams, little periwinkles. Those are somewhat hard to imitate, but you can. Um, and then sea anemones, those are also harder to imitate. So I don't worry about those edge cages as, as much. So my basic selection of flies cover bait fish imitations, crustacean like crabs and shrimp, um, and then some general attractor patterns. So I'm going to start with my favorite fly, and I'm looking down at the flies I haven't laid, laid out on my fly time bench. I'm going to start with my favorite fly that I've caught just about every kind of fish you can think on, think of on, and it's a clouser minnow. Uh, Bob Clouser invented this for smallmouth, and it's a great fly. It's got lit eyes on it. It's made of bugtail. It's got some flash in it, and you can tie this in a number of different colors. I promise we'd talk about flies that you could buy because I know this is geared toward people who have limit, limited time. But you can buy a Clouser minnow from any fly shop. You can go to uh, Bob Clouser's website and get them from him directly. Um, but any good fly shop will have Clouser minnows, and your big box stores like Bass Pro and Cabela's probably have these too. This chartreuse and white is a great color. It is ridiculous how many fish I have caught on a chartreuse and white Clouser. I've caught redfish, sea trout, Jack Crevelli, um, flounder, bass, freshwater bass, um, stripers, croakers, tarpon, I mean, you just name it, bonefish. I've caught all kinds of fish on this fly. It's a great fly. The colors I take with me anywhere I go, chartreuse and white, take that one. For real muddy water, Water that looks like coffee with cream. Solid black or black and purple. Solid black is usually, you can buy those in stores. Shorts and white, you can buy in stores. A solid white, you can buy a solid white clouser in stores. This one has a little red on the throat. I like a little red. And they usually have a little red when you buy them. You don't have to tie these. You can buy these commercially. Save you some time. And then I do like, if you can find them, a clouser that is tan and brown. This one I tied, which I apologize, but this one has tan, ginger, and brown. They make a garnet in red, so they make kind of a yellowish gold with red, dark red, almost a crimson. Um, that's another good color. I take these four colors anywhere I go. Doesn't matter. Great fly, clouser mitter. Second great fly is a lefty's deceiver. This is a minnow, imitates a minnow. It's got bucktail. It's got um, some hackle on the back, bucktail for the collar and shoulders, some flash in it. This one has a red throat. You can buy these at any good fly shop. You can get them at Cabela's, Bass Pro, any of your big box stores. We'll have these Clouser minnows. I don't carry as many colors with these. Um, my standard color is chartreuse and white. These are good for, you know, jacks, sea trout, redfish. Uh, anything that eats a minnow, stripers, anything that eats minnows will eat this. I carry it in green and white, chartreuse and white, anywhere I go. And the other color I carry anywhere I go is solid black. And you can usually get the solid black in any, any fly shop or big box. Um, the black is good when you have really dirty water. It's also good in low light conditions, like a real cloudy day or right before sunset or right before sunrise. 
black silhouettes when you have limited sun penetration black silhouettes really nicely now if i go to south florida this is very important if i go to south florida and i'm fishing anywhere from naples over to flamingo that 10,000 islands area they fish a lot of white and if i go there i will take a solid white clouser with me because they fish a lot of white in that area i mean a lot of white there's a lot of white fish in that area so you've got clousers you got deceivers that's two flies Another fly, subsurface fly I really like, is a half and half. I caught my biggest striper in Delaware on this fly. It's half lefty's deceiver. It's got the hackle on the back with flash, and it's half clouser. You'll see that it's got the lid eyes like a clouser. It's got the shoulder or the collar is out of bucktail. I usually only carry chartreuse and white. Um, this is a great fly. With smaller lead eyes, it's good for snook. It's good for stripers. It's good for redfish. I do have some other colors I use very specifically in Louisiana for this, but this is a great fly. Always carry one of these in your box, no matter where you go. I'm sure it's good. It's also good for Jack Crevelli. It's probably good for rooster fish. I haven't fished for rooster fish. I'm sure they would take it. Any member of the Jack family will take this. It's a great fly. So that's fly number three. We've done clousers, deceivers, and a half and half. The next um, fly that I have that I want to show you all. So um, a lot of saltwater fish eat shrimp. You can imitate shrimp with little small clousers. But a lot of people use this hackle fly or what they call a seducer as a shrimp imitator. And all it is, and you can buy these in the stores. It's got feathers on the back, hackles on the back, and spun hackles on the front. This natural color is a great color. I also like this in purple and black if you can find them for tarpon. Um, this lands very softly. So if you're around some really shallow water and it's got some spooky sea trout or snook in it, it lands very softly. It sinks very slowly. It almost suspends. If you if it's hackled heavy enough here, it will suspend. So if you're in a real if you're in grass flats, then um, it's a really good fly for grass flats. It's a really good fly around the mangroves. You can Put a wee guard on it. Um, you can buy these in fly shops. Sorry, my face again. You can buy these in fly shops. And I carry these in several colors because I tie my own. But if you're going to buy them, this natural grizzly is a great color. And a really great color, which is kind of a standard in salt water and fresh water, is red and white. It's just white hackles on the back with or without a little flash. And red hackles spun around the front to look like gills. This is a great fly. Great fly for snook, sea trout jacks, tarpon, um, bass, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, stripers. Um, this is a great fly. Like I said, it suspends very slowly. It lands very lightly. It's good in shallow water. I really like this fly. So now we've got our clousers, our deceivers, our half and half, our hackle fly or seducer. Now there's an attractor pattern that's really good. It was developed on the West Coast, and it's um, a whistler. Dan Blanton invented this fly. You can buy this in fly shops, and it pushes a lot of water, and it has a lot of bulk. And the two colors I like, I have the black color here. It's got natural saddle hackles, black bucktail, natural saddle hackle throat, some purple flash, and some red um, chenille. Flash, it's, it's cactus chenille is what it is. A chenille that has flashes, unlike the woolly bugger that doesn't flash. It's cactus chenille throat. Um, I have caught stripers on this. I've caught chain pick, pickerel on this. I have caught sea trout on this. Um, they use it on the West Coast a lot for the big stripers out there. It You can catch tarpon on it. The two colors I like would be this all black with purple flash and natural, either natural hackles or black hackles, and then chartreuse and white. Those are the two colors. I always carry one or two of these with me everywhere I go. So the next fly is a very old fly. It's called a bend back. And what you do, and you can buy these in stores too. Your fly shops will have these. You might not see these in big box stores, but your stores will have this. And it's another imitate, another minnow imitation. And basically the hook is bent. Let me see how. Hold this. 
the hook is bent right here at the top, right below the eye. So about two eye lengths down, they bend the hook. And when you bend the hook, you tie the bucktail, or the bucktail is tied on the top here. And you can tie it with bucktail. You can put um, hackle feathers out here with, to look like scales. And you put enough, and this one's been in my fly box, so the bucktail's kind of pushed down. But when it hasn't been pushed down in your fly box, the bucktail hides the point of the hook. And you can throw this thing around oyster bars, you can throw it around vegetation, you can throw it in the mangroves. And when it's tied heavily and the bucktail's in the position it's supposed to be, which is up around the hook point, it won't snag. It's fairly weed free. And you can throw it real shallow. It doesn't have any eyes on it. You can put eyes on it. You can tie it like a clouser minnow and you can make it go deeper. But this is a good fly for where it's really shallow or really snaggy or a lot of grass. If you have a, like in the Florida Panhandle, you've got a couple bays in there with a lot of eelgrass and the grass gets everywhere. Um, this is a good fly when you have a lot of grass. I mean, like I said, you can, you can put lead eyes on it or you can buy it with lead eyes. You can buy it from Bob Clouser with or without lead eyes. I only carry two, well, I carry three colors with this one. Brown over tan, purple and black, and chartreuse and white. And um, this one, of course, is brown over tan to look like a, a mud minnow or a munch, munchamon, munchamon. It's a little small bottom hugging bait fish. So now we've talked about shrimp patterns. We talked about patterns that look like fish. Now we talk about crab patterns. There's a gazillion different crab patterns. There's quans. There's crab patterns. I can't even pronounce the name of them that are all kind of crazy. The first crab pattern I used, I learned how to tie in the first crab pattern I used and you can still buy these in stores today is a Dell's Merkin. This one's just all brown to look like a fiddler crab. These usually in the stores when you buy them come in tan and brown. Sometimes they'll be in solid tan and sometimes they'll be in tan and um, olive. It's just yarn. All it is is yarn. Lead eyes or dumbbell eyes and then some feathers on the back for claws. That's all there is. It's not real fancy. When you buy them in the store they have little rubber legs on them on each side and it imitates a crab and it does a good job and it's a simple fly and I always take something that looks like a crab with me no matter where I go. Different colors. In the southeast the redfish eat a lot of fiddle crabs and blue crabs um, so I use darker colors. In the northeast they use lighter colors. They use the olive and tans a lot in the northeast for stripers. Um, this marking will catch redfish, it will catch stripers, sea trout will eat small crabs, um, sheephead will eat small crabs, Black drum will eat small crabs. Bonefish will eat small crabs. Um, there's a lot of things that eat small crabs. So that covers your crab imitation. You can use that fly or you can go buy a gazillion different crab flies in any of the fly tying stores, uh, fly fishing stores. Just make sure you have something that imitates a crab. Um, you need to have a top water in salt water. And it can be a standard popper like this double barrel popper which you can readily buy at any fly store. It can be just a plain popper, plain head without all the fancy uh, concave and all that. The one thing I like about my poppers, I like the hook to be at the bottom. I don't like the hook to be in the middle. That way it lifts up easier out of the water. It doesn't catch so much water when you lift it out. And I don't, I don't really think you need to have hackle around here, spun around the middle. This little bit of chenille does a nice job of being a transition to whatever tail you want to use. Bucktail. This is synthetic hair. Um, synthetic hair probably will hold up better with bluefish. Uh, bucktail moves nicer in cold water, I think. But this is a decent little popper for salt water. And many things we eat in salt water. We eat poppers. Bluefish, stripers, redfish, sea trout, jack crevelli, um, tarpon. Baby tarpon love little tiny gurglers. Um, you can catch a ton of them like that. Just a popper is a good thing to have. I don't fish poppers for sharks because sharks, their mouth is way set back in the back of their um, snout. And when they go up to hit a popper, they push the popper out of the way. So I don't throw poppers for sharks. Um, you can use a popper to attract a shark and then trail will fly off behind it if you want to. But I just don't use, I don't use poppers for sharks. The other type of topwater I like are these gurglers. You can buy these in any fly fishing store. You can buy them in the big boxes. These gurglers come with legs 
and without pegs. And then there's some, they're similar to a slider. Um, slider is big in the bass fishing world and pike fishing. Uh, I don't use many deer hair bugs for top water. They get chewed up pretty quick. So, and you also need to carry fly floating. So I carry top water when I go saltwater fly fishing, I carry top water bugs that don't need any fly floating added to them, like a deer hair bug. So this has foam on it, floats nice without adding anything to it. I do like the legs if I'm fishing in the Everglades, because in the Everglades, the snook during the winter months, or not during the winter months, certain times of the year, and not the winter months, I'll take that back. Certain times of the year, the snook will eat frogs, um, the big bullfrogs in the Everglades. And I think that the legs are definitely better for bass. This is a great largemouth fly. But in the Everglades where the snook are back far away from the Gulf, I think the legs help. I think it reminds them of frogs a little bit and they will eat frogs. So there's your two topwater flies that you need. It's not very complex. If you do want to fish for sharks, this red and, uh, this is a red and orange deceiver. That's all it is. It's just a big deceiver made of red and orange, a little gold flash in it. Makes it easy for the shark to see, makes it easy for you to see. You can also use um, an eel fly, something that looks like an eel, which is a black uh, fur strip. I don't usually carry those when I'm fishing. I will take those to the northeast for striper, but I don't really fish for sharks anymore. I've caught a ton of sharks. Um, they're kind of more trouble than they're worth. My favorite sharks to fish for are makos and black tips because they jump. Um, a lot of sharks don't jump, so I don't really bother with them. And, you know, getting them off the hook is a whole lot of fun. But if you do want shark fish, take that orange and um, red deceiver with you. So those are the flies. We're looking at something for top water, something for top water, half and half, deceivers, clousers, seducers, whistler, bendback, merkins crab, and the shark fly is optional. One last fly I want to talk about that's not really a fly. So we're talking about seven flies, give or take, if you take out the shark fly. And it's this little spoon fly. If you travel in the southeast and you want to fly fish, take a spoon, spoon fly with you. Whether you're in Texas, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, any of those locations. This little Dupree spoon fly, and there's other manufacturers of it, it's not really a fly. This works great. It's got a little weed guard on it. It does really well where it's really weedy. Um, it flashes and flutters all over the place. It's a great little fly. So I always take one of those with me. If I'm going to the Mid-Atlantic or the Northeast or the New England states, I don't take one of these with me. But anywhere in the Southeast, take this fly with you. So we're looking at about seven different flies that you need to have. Not really that many different colors. Not that uh, not that bad as far as having to buy them. If you're throwing a nine weight, you can throw up to a two alt hook on a nine weight comfortably. So any of these flies in say a size four to a size two alt will work just fine. So those are your flies. So let's talk about leaders. Saltwater leaders are pretty simple. They can be, or you can make them really complex. I like simple. So you can go to the store and buy a standard bass leader. This is a 20 pound, seven and a half foot bass leader. That will work for bass, that will work for salt water. Just fine. Take it out of the, take it out of the package, start using it. If you, last, same thing with the freshwater leaders, the last 18 inches is the tippet. So once you use up 18 inches, you get a little spool of 20 pound mono and tie some more tippet on. If you wanna do salt water specific, they make soft, saltwater specific flies now uh leaders not flies sorry leaders now these will be a little more a little more expensive than the freshwater leaders so this is a saltwater specific leader it's got a picture of a permit it's 10 feet long it's got 40 pound sh tippet on it it's probably a shock tippet um that's fairly heavy you don't need 40 pound for most of your inshore fishing i have this one for really big redfish in grassy areas. Um, I will tell you that these leaders that are store-bought, that aren't, that are tapered with no knots in areas of thick eel grass or thick grass, they won't pick up grass. You can also tie your own. Here I tied a leader, it's 10 feet long, and I wrote down a little uh, post-it note, or 
wrapped it around my hand, wrote on a post-it note, 10 feet, a 40 pound butt with 15 pound tippet. So this leader has a butt section, three pieces for the mid, and then a tippet. And there's lots of people who have recipes for leaders. I have a whole sheet over here. Uh, we'll have a discussion about leaders one day, a longer discussion. You can time yourself. If you keep these store-bought ones, you keep the little plastic bag when you're through with them, you can put that in there. Um, you don't need a fancy leader. There's uh, species-specific leaders. This is a bonefish leader. It's 10 feet long. It's only got 10-pound tippet. Bonefish, as we talked about, take really small, can take really small flies. Bonefish is a whole different subject that we'll talk about later. Um, there are people who are better bone fishermen than I am, and that's okay. So if you want to get one type of leader and fish freshwater and saltwater both with it, that's fine. Just get yourself a bass leader, seven and a half, nine feet long, um, 20 pound, 16 to 20 pound. You can go down to 12 pound for certain situations, but 16, 20 pound, if you think about conventional fishing, most people in short conventional fishing are using 20 pound leader. They might use 40 pound leader when they get down fishing for snook. They have the sharp gill rakers or sharp on their gills. They got sh real sharp uh, rakes on their gills and they'll slice 20 pound pretty easy, the big snook. Um, you can catch a pretty big redfish on 20 pound leader. You can catch a pretty big striped bass on 20 pound leader. Um, the one thing you might want to think about, I didn't set one out, you can buy a leader with a steel piece of steel at the end of it. Bluefish, barracuda, Spanish mackerel, king mackerel, all those type of fish. It doesn't hurt to have a little steel leader on the end of it. And if you buy a, a pre-made leader with the steel on the end of it, you can or titanium wire on the end of it, you can also use it for pike and muskie. Just because you bought it for salt water doesn't mean you can't use it for fresh water. So a steel leader, if you think you're going to be in a place that has king mackerel, Spanish mackerel, um, barracuda, then a steel leader is not a bad thing to have. And buy one, and if you go pike fishing or muskie fishing up in the north or midwest, then use it up there too. Um, so that has your flies, that has your leaders. Now one thing about leaders, saltwater leaders can be very simple because when you're throwing a fly this big, this half and half, it's not a very delicate presentation. You don't need a really fine-tuned leader. There's a lot of guys in saltwater that... They build a simple leader. They take 40 pound fluorocarbon or mono and they take six feet of it and then they tie in three foot, a 30 pound and three foot, a 20 pound. And that's their leader, three pieces. It turns over fine. A lot of people for a nine weight will use a 50 pound butt section, which not it's not a bad idea. This fluorocarbon leader is a little bit stiffer than mono, so you can probably get away with 40 pound. So 40 or 50 pound butt section, six feet, three feet of 30 pound with a blood knot or a um, triple surgeon's loop, and then three feet of 20 pound, and that's your leader. Just that simple. And that'll work fine for redfish. That'll work fine for black drum. It'll work fine for small tarpon. Big tarpon, you really need a specialized leader. It'll work fine for striped bass. Um, it's a good leader formula. Will work for peacock bass. The one thing I will say is big tarpon needs specialized leaders. Big sharks really need more of a specialized leader if you're going to go after them. But those fish that big, you probably don't want to hook on a nine weight anyways. Um, those are knots that are good to know in salt water. There's three knots good to know. One is a blood knot for attaching leader to tippet. Another one is a perfection loop to attach the leader, create a loop in the leader to attach it to your fly line, and then a loop knot to put your flies on. And a the old-fashioned uh, clinch knot also work. So those are knots you need to know. We won't talk about those too much because this video is getting kind of long. I want to talk about just a few other items you need in the salt that we didn't mention. Talked about sharp hooks. Sharp hooks are very important in the salt. I think they're more important in the salt than they are freshwater. Um, a lot of your freshwater species have somewhat soft mouths. A lot of your saltwater species have mouths that are as hard as cement blocks. Tarpon is a good example. Um, the sail cat is a good example. Redfish have a fairly, um, fairly tough mouth. Sheephead have goat teeth in their mouth. They have a really tough mouth and they have teeth. A lot of your saltwater fish have teeth. So be careful, you know, don't be sticking your fingers in saltwater fish's mouth right away. 
A lot of saltwater fish have crushers in the back of their throat for crushing crabs. Don't get your hand back in there. That's a mess. So carry a hook file. Keep your hook sharp at all times. If you have to make a long cast for to a fish, if, if you have to make a 60 or 70 or 80 foot cast for a fish, once you become that proficient, it's hard to stick a hook in a fish at 70 feet with a dull hook. You need to have a sharp hook to help you. Um, and the one thing I mentioned about casting 80 feet with a nine weight fly rod, if you're casting to a fish at 40 to 60 foot in a 30 mile an hour wind, you're going to want to be able to cast 80 feet with no wind because it's just that much harder. Um, there's always wind in salt water. When you get down to the Keys or the Bahamas, if you're on an island, there's always going to be wind. If you're, say, anywhere in the Gulf of Mexico and there's a landmass, either to your north or your east or your west, then you'll have a landmass to help break that wind. And a lot of times you can tuck out of the wind. But if you go, say you've got a business trip or a family vacation to Key West and you get to fish a half day, um, there's always wind coming from some direction in Key West. Or it's just me. I think I attract the wind. That's my wife's theory is I do attract the wind. Um, so there's always wind. And the further you can cast without the wind, it makes it that much better to cast when you're in the wind. Because you don't want to blow a good shot on a fish when you don't, when you have a lot of wind. You need a set of pliers. They don't have to be fancy. Um, these have a little cutting jaw in them. Remember we talked about the other pliers have a cutting jaw in them. These have a cutting jaw in them. The nice thing about fly fishing is you're not using braided line. Because you know scissors and knives cut braided line better than a lot of these cutting jaws. These cutting jaws will go through... Any tippet or monofilament leader that you want to use or forward card and leader we want to use. Carry you some pliers. The thing about pliers, the last time I checked the FAA regulations, you could take pliers on the aircraft, not check them if they're under six inches long. So if you have a little set of pliers that are under six inches long, you can put them in your bag that you have your flies in and take them with you. Unfortunately, if you hook a shark, these little pliers, your hand is a lot closer to the business end of that shark than you want to be. Um, with a stingray, uh, you have to watch that tail. I've unhooked stingrays that have been hooked with this. You know, there's a way to do that. If you're fishing with a guide, it's easier. Um, but you need to have pliers with you at all times in salt water. And if you're driving and you have longer pliers, that's better. It gets your hands away from the business end of whatever you're trying to catch. You need some sunglasses. We didn't talk about this on the previous video. Polaroid sunglasses, very important. Let you see down into the water. It protects your eyes. Um, if you have a strong wind coming on to your casting shoulder, if you're cast right-handed, the wind's coming this way. Or if you cast left-handed, the wind's coming this way. If you don't turn around and do a back cast, or if you don't bring that cast low and up, um, the wind could push that fly right onto your face, right into your shoulder, right into your ear, right into your butt. Wear some good sunglasses that cover your whole eye area to protect your eyes from getting bounced on by a fly. You got a fly like this with those big lead lies coming at your face at a high speed. Um, if you can't get out of the way, I know these don't look as cool, but you need to have something that wraps around your face and covers your eyes and protects your eyes. Eye protection is very important. So don't get cheap sunglasses that aren't polarized. Make sure they're polarized and make sure they have some shatter or impact resistance to protect your eyes. Because, you know, it's hard to fish when you can't see. So get some good glasses. Um, I carry two sets of glasses with me when I travel. I carry a pair of yellow lens glasses for cloudy, overclass, low light conditions. And then I carry a pair of these amber bronzy for inshore most sunglass manufacturers will tell you that it's an inshore lens, it's bronze, it's amber, or green bronze, or come brown, some kind of crazy combination. But they'll say good for inshore. And then the yellow glasses are for low light. They're, they're just yellow. I guess that might be amber. So carry two sets with you, one for low light and one for bright light. Um, you won't regret having some sunglasses that are yellow lens for low light, even if you buy less expensive ones for the low light conditions because you're not going to use them as much carry them anyways and then carry them get you a set of good inshore sunglasses so you've got your pliers you've got a hat don't forget your hat your buff <clears throat> you need hats to keep the sun out of your eyes so you can spot fish 
a dark brim is better than a light brim. Get a buff, cover up your cover up your face and your neck and your nose for sun protection. You got your pliers, your sunglasses, your hook file. Keep those hooks sharp, 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 sharp. You've got your leaders, either store bought, and a good fly fishing shop will help you with that. Get some mono, time yourself, no big deal. Get some spools, use that, time yourself if you want to. And just not even a dozen or so flies. Um, and that's all you need for saltwater. That's what I take everywhere I go. That's it. So now I will try to tilt the camera. I'm not even going to promise I can do this without making a mess. Um, I'm going to take this shark fly out because I hardly ever fish for sharks. And I really don't take this with me anywhere. So we're going to take that fly out. We're not going to count that fly. And that's all the flies you need. So I'm going to grab this thing. This is going to be awkward and ugly. I know you can put in your comments if you want. I don't have any fancy cameras. I'm doing this off my phone. So let's see what I can do here. Uh, uh, I don't know. Is everyone getting seasick? Whoa, whoa. All right, so here you go. That's your gurgler. That's your popping bug. Those are your clousers. Greatest fly. Greatest fly. I've caught so many fish off that fly. It's just stupid. Here's your seducers or hackle fly. Shrimp imitations. Great fly. Over here, you've got your merkin, your crab imitation. You need to carry a crab imitation with you. When you have a crab fly, work it slowly. Most crabs don't go at, uh, don't move at high rates of speed. And um, you've worked the crab fly. Get it close to the fish and work it slowly. I mean, get it close to the fish. You've got your half and half, which is good bait fish imitator. That's probably the only color you ever need. You can go with a solid black one if you want. Your deceiver, those are really the only two colors you need to start with. This is for when water is really muddy. This is for everything else. Your whistler, solid black, chartreuse and white. Your bend back fly, you can do this in chartreuse and white. You can do it in tan and brown. You can do it in uh, solid black or black and purple. I tend just to carry this brown and tan one and use it in really shallow water and tend to use it more in the southeast. So I'm trying to see what you all can see. So I think that's it. I think that's everything. I'm probably got a bad angle right now. Let's go down. And then, of course, the spoon fly for the southeast. But that's it. That's all the flies you need. You don't need a huge amount of flies. You don't need 5,000 flies made of everything to fish in a, to fish near shore saltwater, anywhere on the east coast and the southeast. And some of these work on the west coast too. Like I said, this um, Whistler is a west coast fly. It was invented on the west coast by Dan Blanton. So that's it. All right. So now we're going to spin you around. going to make you dizzy again. Hopefully you saw those flies on the table. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. And we're going to wrap this video up. I know, sorry for the camera work with my phone on a tripod. If I, um, if I get time somewhere in the future, I'll get one of those fancy um, GoPros. I had one a long time ago. My wife got me one. I couldn't even figure out how to use it. The directions that came with it in the book were so small, I couldn't even read the directions. So I gave it to my buddy who were, who's down in Central Florida, and he never uses it either. But if I keep doing this, I'll probably get myself a GoPro with a, one of those chest mounts and do all that fancy action live motion stuff. But right now, we're just going over the basics. So that's all I have. Keep your hooks sharp. Keep your lines tight. Um, and we'll have some more videos about some travel, other travel items. We'll have some stuff about how to sneak in fishing trips when you're on family vacations. We'll have some area-specific talks. We'll talk about a few other things I think you need to take with you, depending on where you're going. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. So tight lines.